So I, I thought I'd try and phrase this a little bit around two camps uh, that have influenced economic thought over the last few hundred years. Uh, on one side, there are uh, mad men in authority distilling their views from what I'll call classical economists. And uh, in that camp, I've put uh, the Bush administration uh, and two of his advisors, John Taylor and Paul Volcker. Uh, on, on the Keynesian camp, uh, I've put uh, the Obama administration and two of his advisors, uh, Larry Summers and Christina Roma. Now, it's extremely unfair to, to box people like this, but when you get to write a book, you get to, to write things that are unfair uh, in order to try and simplify them a little bit. Uh, and that's what I've done here. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the, the ideas that are, are influencing these people. Um, on the classical side, I'm going to start with somebody who's, who's often referred to as the father of modern economics, Adam Smith, who, who wrote his most famous book, The Wealth of Nations, in 1776, the same time as the American Revolution. Uh, I'm going to go on uh, and talk about how those ideas evolved uh, in, uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries with uh, a, 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 an economist, a, a French economist working in Switzerland, Léon Horace, uh, and his successor, Wilfredo Pareto. Uh, really important ideas that, that uh, have influenced all of, of modern economic and political thought came out of those, those people. Uh, and then I'm going to go on to uh, the 20th century and talk about uh, the way that people thought about the economy, business cycles, uh, in the early 1920s, and how those ideas evolved later. Uh, so there's a big jump from Pigou, who's writing in, in the 1920s, uh, and uh, modern versions of classical economics uh, in two modern Nobel Prize winners, Robert Lucas and Ed Prescott. And what happened in between Pigou, writing in 1920, and Lucas and Prescott write, writing in 1980 was Keynesian economics. Uh, I'll, I'll talk in a minute in more detail, but uh, Keynesian economics evolved out of dissatisfaction with classical explanations of what happened in the Great Depression. And uh, some of the people who developed Keynes's ideas that I'll mention were a, a New Zealand economist called Bill Phillips two American economists, Robert Solow and Paul Samuelson. Uh, and finally, I'm going to say a little bit about how I, I put myself in this camp, the Keynesian side, but uh, there's a lot of what I'll tell you that I think resonates with, with uh, classical ideas as well. Okay, so that's a, a snapshot of the people I'll talk about. Um, I, I'd like to try to explain the, the, the progression of ideas uh, in terms of the way that they interacted with events. So economics doesn't evolve in a vacuum. Uh, it, involve, it, it evolves as people look at what's happening in the world around them, and they realize that the theories that they thought were helping understand the world sometimes don't do a very good job. So although I'm firmly in the camp of believing that, that economics is a science, it's not an experimental science. And uh, what that means practically is that we need to rely on the natural experiments that are thrown up for us by history. And there have been three large natural experiments that I, I want to draw attention to that had a huge impact on the history of economic thought. Uh, one was the Great Depression and the stock market crash of 1929. And that event was responsible for uh, a, a, a complete sea change, a change in thought from a set of classical ideas, and I'll explain in a minute what those ideas were, to a set of Keynesian ideas. Roughly speaking, they have to do with uh, how much you think there's a role for government in, uh, in helping to stabilize the economy. So before 1929, classical ideas held sway. After 1929, a whole new way of looking at things came in that was represented by Keynesian economics. And then in 1972, there was another big sea change 
That's, uh, that's the time uh, when uh, Robert Lucas wrote an important article, and that period, the mid-1970s, was a period that uh, caused most economists to give up on Keynesian economics. And the reason for that is that it was a period when uh, we saw very high inflation and very high unemployment at the same time, a period that was dubbed in the press stagflation. And that coincidence of inflation and unemployment is something that was inconsistent with the ideas as Keynes put them out in his, in his most famous book, The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. And as a consequence of that failure uh, of Keynesian economics, people went back to classical ideas, but they reformulated them in, in a new way. So that period from 1972 to the current time, 2008, was a period of the resurgence of classical economics. And the question I'm going to pose at the end of this lecture is, where now? Because I think that the financial crisis of 2008 is another very large natural experiment that has led many economists to start rethinking uh, the ideas that they, they took on board in the rational expectations period. Um, and I, I'd like to offer a few prescriptions about you know, where I think we're going to be going from here. Um, so that slide pretty much I've covered that. So let me go back and, and, and start thinking about the main ideas of classical economics. So economics as a, as a discipline begins with a book in 1776, The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. And this is one of his most famous quotes. It says, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. And that notion that, uh, that naked capitalism in which everybody is looking out for themselves can somehow lead to an outcome that's better for everybody than if it were planned, that's one of the central ideas in, in, in classical economics. And it's one that resonates through uh, all of modern economic uh, today. Here's another uh, famous quote from Adam Smith that I like. Uh, it, Smith introduced the notion of the invisible hand. Uh, and the quote that that comes from, by preferring, well, let's skip the first part, uh, by directing industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, uh, the individual intends only his own gain and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. So really that's the same idea again, coming out in a different quote. Uh, second big idea that's in uh, Adam Smith that's worth mentioning, but is not on this slide, is a fundamental distrust of government. So the, the, the Smith in particular has a number of passages where he's saying, look, uh, the government's just a bunch of people too, and politicians are pursuing their own interests. And it isn't at all clear to me, this is Smith, that, uh, that what they're pursuing when they say they're doing something in the interest of the public good is actually in the public good. And those two sets of ideas, one that private individuals pursuing their own gain is going to make everybody better off, and the second one, that you should distrust government. Those are themes that run through modern conservatives and, and, and modern uh, classical economists. Uh, and they're ideas that uh, were refined uh, very much along the way. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, 